Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. God bless us this morning as we worship together, pray, hear from God's word, and connect together. Just a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention. They, they, they all have to do with prayer, which is kind of a cool thing. First of all, our church-wide prayer meeting is happening this Thursday evening from 7 till 8 p.m. Uh, so join us here at the church as we pray together, pray for our church, our neighborhood around us, and for the country that we live in. I'd encourage you to come out to that. Also, we have our 24 hours of prayer, and the sign-up sheet is at the info table. This is a 24-hour time period where you sign up for a one-hour time slot, and at that time, you pray for our church, for our world, different requests that we're going to uh, have available. You stay at your house and do it. We're not gathering at the church uh, for this 24-hour time, and prayer guides will be put out next week so you know uh, how to structure your prayer time and what to pray for. And then one last announcement on prayer, and that is our World Day of Prayer that's happening on Friday at the end of March. Details are in your bulletin where we're going to be praying uh, for the country of Taiwan. So would love to have you out for that uh, on that day in March. Well, God bless you this morning. We're going to go to a time of prayer now and then our connection time together. We have a couple scripture passages this morning. From The first is from Psalm 33, and the second will be from Colossians 4, 2 to 6. So the first one is Psalm 33. Sing for joy to the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, Sing praise to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lay up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever the plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of men, of all them, he who understands all their works, the king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. He is our heart, our, for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Now we'll turn to Colossians 4, and it's verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders making the most of the opportunity. 
Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Okay, I'll keep talking and you'll find me eventually. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> the little things that happen. Well, thank you, Carol, uh, for bringing our scripture passage this morning. I appreciate that. This is our last Sunday in our Colossians sermon series. I know, it's our last Sunday. And my hope uh, throughout all of this, my prayer uh, throughout all of this, is that it has opened your eyes to the depth of what the Apostle Paul wanted to say. Uh, not only to the church back in Colossae about 2,000 years ago, but to us as well. You know, he wrote many letters. Paul wrote many letters, and most of them are preserved in the New Testament to encourage Christians in their faith. Because, as we know, he wrote almost 2,000 years ago, and yet his encouragement and his teaching is just as needed today as it was back then. Because even though the world has changed, it's still the same, isn't it? Same pressures, same destruction, same ways that it tries to discourage us in our faith. But here is the good news. God is also still the same. God is also still the same. Same love, same grace, same reconciliation, same salvation, and God is greater than whatever the world has. So today we're looking at one of the last teaching passages uh, that Paul wrote, and Carol read that out. So Paul has been talking throughout this letter of how we've been made alive in Christ, and he's been teaching about how Jesus is enough, not only for the world around us, but Jesus is enough for our lives as well. And so now he wants to encourage the Colossian believers, and encourage us to make it count. But before we get into God's word, would you stand with me? Let's pause and let's pray and let's commit ourselves to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can sing your praises about the God that we worship, that you are sovereign over this entire world, that you are at work in this world and at work in our lives, and you are enough. And so, God, this morning we come before you and uh, we want to hear from you. We open up your word and we ask that you would speak to us, that we would have ears that would hear from you, hearts that would receive from you, and that your spirit would be at work in our, in our spirit, transforming us, making us more and more like you. So thank you for this morning, Heavenly Father. We, we open ourselves to you in your name. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Well, I've talked about them before, but I've had the privilege of going on a number of mission trips. And I know that's kind of old school language, mission trips. Uh, but we took a team of people on two different occasions to visit our international workers and to kind of just see what they do. Uh, so we took a trip out to Indonesia and we took a trip out to North Africa. And it's encouraging for them when we get out there. It's encouraging for them because then they can have people that kind of get what it is that they do. They can kind of grasp what it is that they do. But it's life-changing for us because it opens your eyes to a different culture, to a different world, to a different people, and you realize that Jesus is just as real to them. Jesus is just as real to them. He's just as important to them. He's just as much at work in their culture as he is in ours. And that's a beautiful thing. But if, so if you've ever had the opportunity to go on this kind of an international trip, uh, you know what I mean, that there is a lot of preparation that's involved in it. There's a lot of planning that's involved in it. And so with our North, uh, North Africa trip, because of where it was, because it's a very impoverished and underdeveloped country, it was a lot of preparation that we went through. And so we had to make sure that all of our vaccinations were up to date. And we needed to make sure that all of the extra vaccinations that they had for us, that we got them too. And then we had fundraising that we had to do. And we had to shop for appropriate clothing to wear while you're out there. Because you can't just show up in shorts and a t-shirt. It's a different culture. And so we had to plan for the clothes that we would wear. It's also very hot, and so you have to plan for that. And we planned for stuff to bring to our international workers. We didn't realize this, uh, but they have, uh, as workers out there, every Saturday morning they got together for breakfast. Uh, just to encourage each other. Because when you're living in a different culture, sometimes it really wears you down. 
So every Saturday morning, they got together for breakfast together, a good Canadian breakfast that they had together. And we didn't know this, but they had ran out of maple syrup. Now, you can get syrup out there, but it's not maple syrup. And so someone in our church who really, honestly, nobody knew of this connection, Costco had maple syrup on sale. And so we were able to bring to them, because you have to distribute the weight evenly in all of your luggage, I think six bottles of Costco maple syrup. And so we show up at this breakfast. We arrived on a Friday, and then the, our first kind of activity there was to join them for this breakfast. And we thought, you know, well, let's bring our gifts, you know, that we brought for, and we had other stuff that they had, that they had asked for us to bring. You know, there are eyeglasses that they had ordered online, and we brought them, and there were just, you know, just some other stuff that we brought. And then all of a sudden, we haul out maple syrup, and we're like, I don't know if you guys need maple syrup, but here's six liters of maple syrup, and they're like, how did you know? And we're like, what do you mean, how did we know? It's just maple syrup. Yeah, it was kind of cool to see all of that happen. So there was all of that preparation. But then there were also the preparations of our heart. And so there were many evenings of prayer that we spent together. And we studied God's word together. And we had Skype calls with our workers. We paid a lot of attention to the preparation before we left on this trip. You know, even if you go on a vacation, you prepare for it, don't you? You look at what the weather is going to be like, and you prepare for that. Uh, you pack sunscreen. Maybe you pack an extra bathing suit if you're spending a lot of time in it. Uh, you look at maps of where you're going. You check out the websites of attractions that are out there. You know, maybe you even pre-book the activities that you want to do. You prepare for it. Why? Well, because it's meaningful to us, isn't it? You want to be prepared. You know that it's important to be prepared. You know that when you're prepared, things work out better, right? So this morning, we're looking at the question, how much do we pay attention for how we're supposed to live in this world? You know, as believers in Jesus, how do we prepare ourselves? Are we aware of what we're up against? Are we aware of kind of the journey that we're going on? And how do we prepare for it? Because here's the thing. Jesus has placed us on a mission. Jesus has a plan for this world. He has a plan to redeem this world, and he wants us to be involved in that plan. There are people around us that need Jesus, that need to be ministered to. They need to know that Jesus is enough for them. He's placed us in this world, and he wants us to be responsive to his plan for this world. So wherever God has placed us, he wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be prepared to engage with the world, that it would become just a kind of natural thing of who we are, because Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for this world. Jesus is enough for our lives, and Jesus is enough for every single person that we encounter in this world. You know, God doesn't call everyone to journey to Africa. But God places us in our families, or God places us in our school, or God places us in our workplace, or God places us in our friendship group, and God wants us to be light in that world. So in the passage that we're looking at this morning, Paul is calling the Colossian Christians and us to live this kind of life, to live this kind of mission-focused life, this preparation life. So let me bring us back into the book, just to kind of bring us up to speed. So at the beginning of the book, Paul encouraged these Christians in their faith. He encouraged them in their faith. He says, yes, you made the right decision. Keep going. Keep at it. Keep believing in Jesus. And then he goes on to tell them why they've made the right decision. That Jesus is enough. That Jesus doesn't need to be added to. He wants them to know. He wants them to understand who Jesus is, that Jesus is the creator of everything, that Jesus is the sustainer of everything, that Jesus is actually bringing everything back to the place that he wants it to be. And Jesus has placed himself in us. All of the glorious riches that are part of Jesus, he has brought that fullness into our lives. 
And then he tells them about the right way to live for Jesus. And we spent a couple of Sundays looking at that. He says to them that you have been made alive in Christ. That Jesus has brought you out of death. He's brought you out of destruction. And he's brought you in to life. That you are on this pathway. And now you are on this pathway. So he says, continue to walk in that and shed the clothes of your former self and put on the clothes that lead to life. And finally, today, he tells them how to live well in this world, how to live missionally in this world. Because Paul says, you need to realize, you need to see yourself and how you interact with this world. You need to see yourself differently. Because Jesus is enough. And that means that everything that we do, it counts. It counts for his kingdom. And so he's encouraging them to partner in ministry with him. So he encourages them to partner with him in prayer, to partner with him in the way that they act towards people, and then to partner with them in their conversations. So this is like being prepared for the mission that Jesus is sending them on. This is being prepared for the calling that Jesus has placed on their lives. So we'll look at three areas this morning that prepare us to engage with the world. Well, the first thing that Paul wants that the believers to know, he wants them to know that their prayer life matters. And so he says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. The first way to prepare yourself to live missionally in this world is to pay attention to your prayer life. So I have a friend, Ken, back in Manitoba, and he is probably one of the most devoted sports fans that I have ever encountered. And his team of choice is the Winnipeg Jets. It's contagious. So Ken's basement room, the TV room, where he watches Jets games, he installed LED color-changing lights and he programmed them so that when a Jets game is on, it's Jets blue that shines in that room. He has season tickets. He's had season tickets since the Jets made their way back uh, to Winnipeg in 2011. And for the games that he's not there physically in person, because he, he splits his season tickets with another person. So for the games that he's not at the arena, he watches the game at home, of course. He never misses a game. And if he does miss a game, he watches it later. And even if he watches the game, he watches the highlights of the game after the game is done. Ken knows the statistics of exactly what's going on right now. Ken knows every player. He knows every coaching staff. He knows the lineups. He can tell you at any given time exactly who's on the ice at any particular time. He knows the lines. He knows the shift changes. Ken commits a, gr a great amount of time focusing on what he loves. You would say that he is faithful. You would say that he is devoted. Ken is committed to the Winnipeg Jets in good times and in bad. I think he mourned their loss when they moved away uh, and he rejoiced when they returned. Ken is not a fair weather fan. He doesn't just jump on the bandwagon when they're doing well. Whether they are in first place or in last place, Ken is faithful. This is what Paul is calling Christians to be in our prayer life. You know, often our prayer life is a fair weather commitment. You know, let's be honest. Often our prayer life is a fair weather commitment. Sometimes our prayer life is even just a last ditch effort. We pray when we're desperate, right? But Paul is saying, be devoted to prayer. Be faithful to prayer. When things are good, pray. When things are bad, pray. When you feel like it, pray. When you don't feel like it, pray. When it's inspiring and everything is clicking and everything is going well and you're seeing answers and you know the presence of God, pray. And when it feels like you're just simply putting in time, pray. Be devoted to prayer. And of course, the example is Jesus. Because Jesus taught his disciples the importance of devotion in their prayer. You know, it always kind of grips me when they're praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus goes off to pray by himself and he comes back to his disciples and what are they doing? They're asleep. You know, they don't understand. They don't realize what's coming. 
They're just asleep. And it says that they were exhausted from grief. What does Jesus say to them? Get up. Pray. Pray that you don't fall into discouragement. You know, the early church knew this as well. They practiced this well. They prayed when they saw miracles. They prayed when they saw healing, and deliverance of people, and people being saved, and people being called into ministry. Man, it's easy to pray during those times. But they also prayed when they were imprisoned, and when they were being persecuted, and when people were losing their lives because of the testimony of Jesus. They prayed when they knew that God was with them, and they prayed when it looked like God was not answering. They prayed when they felt like giving up. They were devoted to prayer. Paul says that there are three ways to be devoted to prayer. First of all, he says, be watchful, be on guard, be awake, be aware. So there's a story about the old days of Russia when it was under Soviet control. And there was a man, a reporter by the name of Ivanovich, and he visited the Moscow Zoo. And he was being given a tour by one of the leaders of the Kremlin. And he was amazed that in the zoo, in the Moscow Zoo, there was this display that featured a bear and a lamb in the same cage. And there was a sign above this cage that, that said, peaceful coexistence. And his guide explained that peaceful coexistence was one of the blessings that came from living in a communist society. But then the guide said quietly to Ivanovich, of course, we have to put a fresh lamb in the cage every morning for the coexistence to continue. The disciple Peter wrote that we have an enemy who even though he is defeated, he has not ceased hostility. He wrote this, he said, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Paul says, be watchful in your prayer. Be alert in your prayer. Pray with one eye open. Because there is no such thing as peaceful coexistence with our enemy. Be alert. Be aware. Be watchful. Next, Paul says, be thankful in your prayer life. Because God deserves to be thanked for everything he does. And I know that when thankfulness becomes the core of our prayer life, it trickles into every other area of our heart. You know, we live in such a consumer society, don't we? You know, we live in a society that tells us constantly that what we have is not enough. You know, our house isn't enough. Our decorating style isn't enough. Our car isn't enough. Our paycheck isn't enough. Even our bodies aren't enough enough. If only we had more, well then we would be thankful. But we need to practice that Jesus has given us enough. He's given us enough. He says that he gives us enough to face the day. The heart of Jesus is that Jesus is enough. This is what Paul has been talking about. And in order to internalize that, that yes, if Jesus is enough, I need to practice being thankful. You know, I think that's probably one of the greatest deficits in our world, is we lack thankfulness. We think we have so little. You know, we think that we're so deprived. We think that we have been, you know, maligned in some way, that we've missed out on something that somebody else has. But we have so incredibly much. And this is true in our spiritual lives. You know, we forget so easily that of everything that God has done for us. So Paul says, be thankful in your prayers. Let thankfulness be such a, 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 a big part of your prayers that it trickles itself down if, into everything in your life. And the very last way that Paul says to, that our prayer life should be missional is to pray for open doors to reach people that God would be the one that opens up closed doors. You know, so often all we see in our lives is a closed door. I know you see the closed doors in your life. I see them in my life. We see them in our world. We see them in our workplaces. We see them in our families. Closed doors are everywhere. And you know, we pray that God would give us the strength to deal with the door 
right? We pray that God would give us the strength that we could keep knocking on the door. And we pray that God would give us the strength that we could keep hitting our head against the door. But how often do we pray that God would open the door? You know, catch the irony of what Paul is saying, because this is rich. So here's the Apostle Paul, and he's sitting in prison, armed prison with bars and everything, and he's chained. He's chained to a guard, and he's under arrest, and he's awaiting his trial and execution, and yet he's praying for open doors to reach people. He can't go anywhere. If anyone is facing a closed door, it's Paul. And yet here he is praying for open doors because he knows that nothing is too great for God. So let me ask you this. Are you praying for open doors in your life? Are you asking for open doors to be a light in your workplace or in your family? Are you asking for God to open doors in people's hearts? You know, even for our church, are you asking God that there would be open doors that we would have to reach more people? That there would be open doors that we would have to minister in our neighborhood? That we would have open doors to be able to bring light into dark places? You know, God has doors that he wants to open that we have no idea about. He, he has doors that we think are so securely bolted, that are so securely shut, that there's nothing that we can do to open them. But he is the God that opens doors for us. How often do we pray for that? Because nothing will deepen your prayer life. Nothing will make your prayer more devoted to what God is doing than if you pray and ask that God would open those doors. Those doors that you think that are firmly closed, that God would open them. Well, Paul says that if you want to live missionally, you need to pay attention to your prayer life. Be devoted in prayer. And now Paul says that the next characteristic of being this missional life, of being prepared for the world and to the way to act in our world is that our daily conduct matters. Paul says that believers should be wise in the way that we act toward the outside world, that we should make the most of every opportunity, that we would choose the best way, that we would choose the most appropriate way that others can see and come to know Jesus. And this has always been God's heart. So you have to journey all the way back into the Old Testament. And you have to realize that when the nation of Israel was being formed, when they were being established and sent into the promised land, God had a calling on them. God had a purpose on them. And it says this in the book of Deuteronomy. And so Moses is saying this to the Israelites. They're just about to cross the Jordan into the promised land. And Moses gives this command to them. He says, see, I have ta taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about all of these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. God's intention has always been that the world would understand who he is by looking at his people. That's always been God's intention, that we would be the tangible testimony of God, that we would be the outpouring of God, the hands and feet of God through our actions and our behaviors. Paul told this to Timothy. He said, watch your life. Watch your doctrine closely. Preserve in them. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You know, just like the calling on the Israelites, Paul says the same thing to Timothy, says the same thing to us. Pay attention to your behavior because the world is watching us. You know, I think sometimes we wish that the world would stop watching us. You know, that we could just do our own thing and they could get the example of God and understanding of God from someplace else. But that's not how God set it up. God designed it this way. God designed that the world would encounter him through his people being a testimony to God. 
your daily conduct matters. And one last thing that we're looking at this morning. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Your conversations count. If you're going to be missional to the world that is out there, that is outside the faith, you need to pay attention to your conversations. So our daughter, Hannah, is graduating this spring. We're so excited. And we have this parent committee uh, that we've put together that's fundraising for the banquet, for the grad banquet. It's kind of, you know, to offset the cost of the tickets, but it's also to provide for people who can't necessarily afford it. And so we've had a couple of fundraisers so far. We've had a bottle drive. Uh, we've helped serve uh, a meal at a Legion supper that they had going on. Uh, we ran a canteen at the, the high school volleyball tournament, but probably one of the biggest ones that we're doing right now is our pierogi supper that's coming this Thursday. And we've advertised it, you've probably seen it in the community, and when we got together as a parent group and we started planning all of the details of it, well, we really didn't know what to expect. And so we sold tickets uh, to the actual supper, but we also decided to sell you know, f packages of frozen pierogies just to kind of see, you know, can we generate enough fundraising for all of this? Well, we've stopped selling tickets and we've stopped advertising it because we can't make any more pierogies. And so Laurel and Hannah, they're at uh, the Ukrainian Catholic Church yesterday. They're helping to make pierogies. And of course, you know, the babas that are there, they're in charge because they want to make sure that it's done right. Right? You know, they have a reputation to be uphold, you know, to uphold with all of it. They need the pierogies to taste, you know, the right way. And so they're in charge of all of this. But with all of the help that was there, they are making 700 dozen pierogies. Now, I know, that's 8,400 pierogies if you're good at math. <laughs> 700 dozen pierogies. If you don't have your tickets yet, you can't come anymore. <laughs> You know, who knew that Ukrainians loved their pierogies this much? You should have known, but who knew? So as Laurel is there working in the kitchen, and she's chatting with other moms, and chatting with the grads, and chatting with the grandmas and the babas, she was marveling, and she said, this is how it's supposed to be. This is what it's supposed to be. This is what community is supposed to look like. You know, this is what we've been lacking over the last couple of years with COVID working together to accomplish something great. You know, Paul says that there is a way to make a difference in this world. There is a way to make a difference in this world. There's a way that we can bring all that God has done in us and we can bring it to this world. He says there is power in your prayer. There's power in your prayer. So be devoted to it. He says that there is power in your actions. Your conduct matters. Pay attention to it. And then he says, there is power in your words, that your conversations count. Don't let any of this go to waste. Use it for God's kingdom. Paul says, let your speech be full of grace. And that word grace, it's just such a rich, rich word. It just means unmerited favor. It's the same word that we use when we talk about the grace of Jesus that he brings. Paul says, in the words that you speak, be intentional to give people what they don't deserve. Be intentional to give people what they don't deserve. Edify them. Build them up. Even if they don't deserve that, don't just match their conversations. Elevate them. Be a dispenser of mercy. Even if other people have hurt you, even if there's tension in the conversation, even if there's past wounds to go through, Paul says, let your speech be filled with grace. Let it overflow with grace, dripping with grace, infused with grace. You know, how much would the world sit up and pay attention to the message that we have to say if they experienced that, right? How much would they see Jesus in our lives if simply our conversations with them were grace-filled conversations? How many arguments would just be diffused? They would just vanish. How many walls would come down if our conversations were filled with grace? And then Paul says, let your speech 
be seasoned with salt. I love that. It's such a rich metaphor because salt is such a practical thing in this world. Speech that is seasoned with salt is very valuable. Salt was very valuable back in the ancient days. It was often given as currency. It's where that phrase, he's worth his weight in salt, it's a Roman phrase about paying soldiers in salt. That's where it comes from. Wars were fought over salt because of how precious salt is. So Paul says, make sure that your speech is valuable to the person hearing it. Make sure that your speech dispenses goodness in their life. Make sure that your speech enriches their life. You know, he talked in a previous chapter about the riches of Christ that have been dispensed upon us. Paul says, take those riches and pour them into somebody else. Pour them into somebody else with your speech. Speech that is seasoned with salt always sways things to godly ways. You know, salt in those days was also a preservative. And it would keep food from decaying. It would keep food from rotting. And so in much of the same way, our world and the conversation around it, it's rotting conversation. It's decaying conversation. And so as Paul says, let your conversation, let your infusion into the world, turn people away from the rot of this world. Let it preserve the conversation. And let it bring it on to God. Let it be a preservative. And one last thing, speech that is seasoned with salt helps to heal people. You know, salt has medicinal uses. So I took a trip to Israel, and I'm sure I've told you that many times, and we did a day at the Dead Sea. And we had a free morning where we could go and enjoy the mineral spa, or I went down with a couple other guys to the actual Dead Sea. And the night before, our guide had kind of given us a briefing as to when the bus would leave and all of that. And he said, oh, and one last word. Do not shave the beard. And kind of like the bird. Do not shave the beard. And the ladies, do not shave the leg. And we're like, okay. Well, some people did. Wow, did that sting. Because if you put salt in a wound, it will sting. But it'll also cleanse it. And it'll also bring healing. And so Paul says in the same way, let your words be healing in a person. You know, sometimes that is healing that is soothing. Sometimes it's words of encouragement. Sometimes it's words of just simply lifting up a person's spirit and encouraging them and soothing them. Sometimes it's words that sting a little bit. Sometimes it's words that are challenging. Sometimes it's words of truth that are spoken in love. But if our words are spoken well, if our words are infused with salt, it's healing to a person. Well, let me close our time. You know, throughout all of this book, we've asked the question, Paul asks the question, the Colossian Christians are asking the question, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? Because we're kind of being battered from all sides. And we're kind of wondering, is Jesus enough or should we add more to Jesus? You know, is Jesus enough for the world around me? Because I see this world and I see the destruction in this world. And I wonder, you know, is Jesus enough for the world around me? Is he enough for everything that this world is going through? Is Jesus enough for my life? You know, because I've got things going on in my heart. I've got things going on in my personal world. Is Jesus enough for, for me? Is Jesus enough to meet my needs? Is Jesus enough to set me on a different path? And then even today, is Jesus enough for everyone else that needs him? Is he enough for this world and the people of this world? And Paul says again and again, yes, Jesus is enough. He's enough. I'm going to tell you about how he's enough. But you'll never know the richness and the depth of the enoughness of Jesus until you follow after him. You know, so often in our lives, we hedge our bets, right? You know, we, we play the full game. You know, we, we, we want to know that with, we're playing it safe. You know, the world around us asks us, are you sure Jesus is enough? You know, how can you be sure 
that Jesus is enough? How can you be sure that Jesus alone has everything that you need? And you know, as believers and followers of Jesus, we face this question for the last 2,000 years, and still, Jesus comes out on top. He still comes out on top. So let me encourage you in your faith. Let me encourage you in your faith. Jesus is enough. He's proven himself that he's enough. The testimony of his word is enough. Who he is in and of himself is enough. It's the testimony of simply who he is. But he wants you to know that he is enough for your life. He wants you to know that whatever you're facing, no matter your doubts, no matter your fears, no matter your concerns, no matter the things that swirl around in your mind, he wants you to know that he is enough in your life. And he wants you to follow after him. And he wants you to learn about him. And he wants you to seek him. And he wants you to discover more and more and more the depth of his enoughness for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are enough. Sometimes it's hard to believe that. We ask you to strengthen our faith because we have a world that talks pretty loud in our ear. But you say that you are enough. No matter what's going on in this world, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's going on in the lives of people around us, you are enough. So Jesus, we open our hearts to you and we anchor our hearts in you and we say you, you alone. Show us Teach us, encourage us in our faith as we seek after you. You say in your word that when you seek me, you find me. You are a findable God. So Jesus, we just commit ourselves to you afresh. We give our hearts to you afresh. We anchor our faith in you in a new way and we say that you and you alone are enough for our lives. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name.